the focus today, of course, is serving Holy Communion in a senior care home. And just by way of introduction, I want to say that if I were to cast a vision for this, my heart would be that residents of senior care homes would be able to participate in this opportunity to honor the Lord Jesus through Holy Communion. And it's something that we'll talk about, but it's something that has been kind of set aside because of the logistics and the challenges of theological differences. And uh, I want to try to bring some light and freedom to our intent and desire to make sure residents get to share in this amazing opportunity. I'd like to begin with prayer. And if we can just bow our hearts before the Lord and ask him to oversee what we're doing here. Father God, what an amazing sacrament you've given us to observe and to be able to see you in a greater way, to know you deeper through Jesus our Lord. And I just ask that all that we do in this seminar, this little Zoom meeting, would be honoring to you and edifying to one another. I ask for your presence because we gather in your name, Jesus. We welcome you and we pray your kingdom come and your will be done as a result of our efforts today. Teach us, Lord. Guide us. We ask this for your glory and your honor. Amen. Everybody should have an outline. At least we emailed one to you. And so hopefully you have an outline. And I'm going to be going through it. And anytime there's a, a blank line in the middle of a sentence, you will see on this PowerPoint screen yellow highlighted words that you can fill in on those uh, blank spots. So let's get started. You can start on page one of your outline. And I will say this, that my, my style of study is, I, I know that there's a lot of traditions out there and directives that various church denominations uphold. My approach is always, let's look in scripture first and see what God has said throughout the Bible. And then, you know, kind of understand that the best we can, and then look at people's traditions or the different church traditions so that we are not being led by what the church is do doing today, which could at times be a compromise, but instead we're being led by scripture. And then we're looking at all these traditions and, and ideas and seeing what they are saying so that it might add to our learning or at least help us to understand why people do what they do. So um, this seminar will be based primarily on what I find in scripture. So we're going to start with the top of, of your page. And I want to start out by just recognizing that there's a number of titles for communion. I call it Holy Communion or, or Communion. But um, of course, we know that it can be called Eucharist, the Lord's Table, the Lord's Supper, the Table of the Lord. Uh, there's various names, and I, it's it's good to just recognize that this is what some people will be calling it. The other thing is that it's recognized in the church as a sacrament or an ordinance, and some will even call it a ritual. And I was thinking about this, like how important is, is it? in God's eyes, to uphold this sacrament. And so I, in order to do that, I looked in the dictionary what sacrament and ordinance and ritual meant, particularly the sacrament and ordinance. These were some of the definition words that came. Commands, directives, decrees, statutes, requirements, regulations. And I started looking at that thinking, wow, that's not small. You know, Jesus 
instituted this sacrament and he said to do it. And he also, as we know, he told Paul about it as well. Uh, Paul was not there when he had the first uh, time of communion with the disciples. But it was important enough that he told Paul about it. And Paul, of course, told the church. So I'm looking at that and saying, okay, here are these commands and directives for participating in this, this uh, event, this, this sacrament. And I thought, well, what other sacraments are there in the church? And we know, of course, of baptism. We know of anointing the sick, which some churches recognize as one of the primary sacraments, marriage, and there's a lot of others. In fact, on your papers, I highlighted something that I thought was really important for us to consider. Because if these are commands, directives, uh, strong guidance from Jesus, what about so many others? And I, I just wrote out a couple of verses that were that came to mind in Matthew 18, where Jesus talks about forgiveness and Matthew 25, where he talks about caring for the least of these brothers of his and Matthew 28, where he commanded us to go and make disciples. Now I know we may call those different things like the great commission or whatever, but they really are directives from Jesus that are so critically important. Uh, and I also thought it was interesting. So in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we see the presentation of the bread and the cup and how Jesus presented that as his body and blood. But in John, the beloved John, he doesn't talk about it. And instead, he talks about washing feet. And I was looking at that and looking at all these other directives that Jesus came, gave us. And I think that whether or not I'm right to say, well, they could be considered sacraments or not. I do say that Holy Communion has a way of tying these all together because we're looking into the face of Christ, into the life, the person of Jesus and seeing who and what he is. And that is just pulling us back into all that he is not just communion but all that he is from prophecy all the way to revelation to our return home in his kingdom not sure how that works for you but i just i find that it's communion has so many component components and it's so deep so next i'd like to talk to you about respecting other traditions it, this is so important friends that um, there's so many different views of this and and as long as they do not compromise clear biblical principles we need to be as gracious and respectful as we can i'm not saying that we need to uphold something that is violates the directives of jesus and scripture but definitely, if somebody's calling it something different than we do, or somebody, you know, does it a little bit different, that can obviously be quite okay. Amen? Uh, some of the elements that we use for serving communion is, of course, we use bread or wafers, crackers. I I, I kind of like when it is possible, and it's a rare occasion, to use pita. And I like a pita loaf, loaf bread thing. Uh, it's unleavened, and it's one loaf, and I like to tear it off because it's, it represents more of what Jesus was sharing. And But I obviously know from a logistical perspective, we use wafers or sometimes crackers. Also, the juice, I highly recommend, even though your tradition may say it has to be fermented wine. We're in a nursing home environment. A lot of people are on medication. It's not a good thing to 
provide a fermented drink. So what I like to use, I go to the grocery store and I get a little six pack of these Welsh's 100% grape juice. And I'm not getting the advertisement credit for this, but it's it's what I do. I like it to be 100%. I look at the ingredients, make sure there's no fructose in it and stuff like that. It's not like they're drinking a lot of it, but I just um, want it to be as pure, I guess, if as I possibly can. So in regard to logistics, I want to create a respectful environment. And so what I will do is I will set up a communion table prior to the residents coming into the room. I don't want that to be like, oh, yeah, we're putting this thing together. I don't want them to see that part. And, you know, we use what we can, whatever the nursing home has. It's kind of a makeshift approach. But um, I, this is one example. Just a, a week or two ago, I served communion. And so they had a table there. I just took the table. And I had this little white cloth that I've had for years. And uh, that cellist somebody gave me a long time ago. And a little bowl of the wafers. And so I set that up so that when they come in, they can see that this is part of the service for the day. And I want it to be as respectful as I possibly could make it. Oh, the other thing is I try to have worship music playing when the residents come in. This should be uh, something that we do all the time in any service so that as you're gathering the residents, it can take, uh, I have... 30 people in the one home that we have services in on a pretty regular basis. And it takes a good 20 to 30 minutes to bring them all out. I want that music playing for the very first person that comes in and so that there's a worshipful environment and they can start focusing in on the Lord and what's important. Some other logistics is to make provision for all believers I I know that sometimes there's there's a lot of logistical issues to work through and we we do our best to adapt to the group size and their cognitive capacity sometimes sometimes we have to make a lot of adjustment for that for me when I have the larger groups like that I like to put them in a semi circle in Sometimes, you know, if it's a smaller group, it'll be people gathered around a large table or a group of tables. It depends on the situation. The one friend I have has like a horseshoe shaped table arrangement. So there's like four or five tables and they just put them in a horseshoe shape. And that way she can get to all of the residents by going into the center of the horseshoe and working around them. And that has worked really well for her. Uh, but if you have them in rows in their chairs uh, in, in a larger group, you want to make sure that you create space between the rows and wheelchairs. The you know some people have leg rests, and you don't want to be kind of stepping over people's legs and stuff like that as you're going to each of them through the through the rows. So what I would like to do now is just to kind of give an overview of what I have been doing for serving communion. Again, I, I well, let me just say, I have two homes that I go to almost weekly. And the one home has about 30, sometimes a little bit more residents, staff, family members are also there. And so we have to really pack them into a, a chapel place that we have. And the other home, it's an assisted living, and the people are, uh, most of them are pretty cognizant, and they have the dexterity to handle the elements themselves. And so I, I serve a little bit different there. But this would be primarily what we do in our services. So you may want to look on page two. I gave you some space for writing all this out. So... Our communion services are very similar to our weekly Bible fellowship hour, and we always 
begin where you know like i said there's music playing as the residents are being gathered uh, i spent a little bit of time talking to them as a welcome i might recognize somebody who had been in the hospital and now they're back uh there might be a re prayer request time asking if people have prayers and then we have an opening prayer and then we sing two or three hymns now for me i use the song books that the Sunshine Society created several years ago that are giant print and uh, pretty much any resident can read them because the print is that large. They have a spiral bound uh, spine on them so they fold over them on themselves and you can hold them with one hand. The nice part about that is that we, I, I personally, do not have the talent for singing or leading singing at all. And so what we do is we use the CDs that Sunshine created uh, years ago. And so it has the music on a lower key and a slower pace, and also the words are sung. And so I will use that when I don't have a pianist. Uh, after two or three hymns, I will share either a story or ask some questions related to the message that we're going to share that day. And of course, because we're serving communion on this particular day, I will be talking to them about, a, you know, maybe a story related to remembering Jesus or some kind of aspect of that points them to the the point of the message. I love to ask them questions. And it's really amazing how engaged they can be. You know, there, one gal was talking about one of our, um, the chapter in God Cares for You, the book that we wrote. And she's starting that again in her group. And the first chapter is on change. And so she took a whiteboard into the home and she asked the residents, what are the things that you have seen change in your lifetime? And so on this whiteboard, she's marking down all these things. And it gives the residents a chance to be engaged. Now, I like to do that because it also gives kind of a preface to where the message is going. And it breaks up the, the hymn time a little bit. Then after that, I might sing one or two or even three more hymns. And then after we sing those, we collect the songbooks and we distribute the scripture sheet. Uh, every service we have, we have a large print uh, scripture sheet that has the verses on that we're going to be, that will be our primary focus that day. And so we like to pass those out while we're collecting the songbook. We share the message, of course, and then we... Of course, in this time, the, the message would be related to communion. And then once we get the message out and, and share that, we present the elements and share um, what Jesus said when he presented them. Now, I want you to see this word present, and I ask that you write it down too, because a lot of traditions say they consecrate the elements. I don't have a problem with that per se, but me personally, I don't think I do anything to them. I don't think they change. I don't think they become something that they were before I present them, but I do present them and I share um, what Jesus said when he presented them. I don't believe that when Jesus presented them, they changed either, but he was speaking to his disciples, and as I'm presenting these, I'm speaking to my audience and asking them to not just see things physically, but to embrace the spiritual aspect of what we're doing. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But uh, so I present the elements, and then what I do is I give instruction to prepare the audience to receive or decline receiving. If we tell what this service is for, what this sacrament is about, and we tell them, you know, what I say to them is, well, this is how I'll do it. Let me just say it this way. 
I'll take the bread, I'll lift it up, and I'll say, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread into his hands. He lifted it up and gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to the, his disciples. And he said, this is my body, do this. And I'll look at the audience and I'll say, what was the next thing he said? They said, do this in remembrance of me. Most of them will say that. And I want them to hear, hear it and say it and embrace it like, do this in remembrance of me. Then, of course, I'll take the cup. I'll lift it up. I will share on the same night or in the same way Jesus took a cup into his hands. He lifted it up and he gave thanks. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, drink this, all of you. This is the blood, my blood in a new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of many. As often as you drink this, do this. Why? And of course, in remembrance of me. So I make a, a kind of a big deal about we are receiving this bread and this cup in remembrance of Jesus. What are we remembering about him? And then I will talk a little bit about his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension to heaven, and his promise to come back to us and, and take us home. And so I will say to the residents, if you can take this communion, receive this communion in remembrance of Jesus, as a believer in Jesus, you are welcome to receive. But if you are not a believer and you don't want to, or if there's any other reason you do not want to receive communion today, and I may talk to them about if you're holding unforgiveness or if you are living in a sinful situation that you have not been willing to give it over to Jesus, you may want to decline from receiving. And so anyway, I will say that. And then I'll, I say to them, if you don't want to receive communion today, all you have to do is say, no, thank you. And I, I go by them and I will, if a person says no, and occasionally they do, I'll just put my hand on their shoulder and I'll pray a very short little blessing. Lord, please bless this person. You know, may, um, usually I know their name. Please bless Alice and watch over her. And so I don't want Alice to feel a less like she's a less than or that she's being left out of the love that's being shared in this time. But I also want to respect that she might have a very legitimate reason to not receive communion today. While we're distributing the, the, the communion, we want to be playing familiar hymns so that the residents can sing along and still participate. Because when you have a lot of people, it can take you know a good 10 plus minutes to get through all of them. Now, what I do is, as I showed in the picture earlier, I have this cup, I'll hold it in one hand and I will uh, have a person with me who will hold the bowl and with the, the wafers in it. And so in, in the skilled care nursing home, the way that I serve it is I will take the wafer, I'll dip it in the cup, and I'll say to the resident, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ given to you out of love and mercy, receive this in remembrance of him. And so they, they know that, that I'm going to do this because I told them, and they open their mouth. And I will tell you, it's a skill, but you got to learn it if you're going to do it this way, to plop it in their mouth without touching them. And you can see uh, in my hand where I'm holding the chalice that there is a napkin that just in case there is some situation where I either touch them or the, you know, something doesn't go well, I have a napkin to prevent awkwardness, I guess I would say. But, and you, the other thing I like to do is to get on eye level. I kneel in front of every one of these residents when I serve it. And uh, my knees can still do that, so I do that. And so next to me, you can't see this person, but there's a person holding the bowl 
of the wafers and assisting me in whatever else might be needed at that time. So after serving the audience, what is really important is that we, the person who's helping me serve and myself, we will go up to the very front of the room and I will serve my helper. And then my helper serves me. And I want to do that so that everyone sees that we are participating with them. And I don't ever want them to get the feel that uh, we're kind of above you and we just did this for you. And so um, I want them to see that we're together with them in this. So then what we'll do is we'll share final thoughts and conclusions related to the message and or communion. And then we lead in a time of engaged prayer and i have the word engaged there because one of the things that we like to share with those who we're providing training for is the way that we teach the residents to pray now on the bottom of each scripture sheet we write out a prayer that's related to the verses that we provide for them. And before I have the residents get involved with prayer, I will read that for them. I will say to them, on the bottom of, of your page is a prayer, and I'd like to read this for you. And if you think it's a good prayer, we can all pray this together as believers. But let me read it for you first. And then I will read it nice and slow. In fact, I have one right here. Now, this particular message was for John chapter 7 when Jesus went up to the temple kind of unnoticed not in public and so we talked about why did Jesus have to hide him himself or why did why are no actually we talked about what were all the opinions of the people his brothers had opinions the Jews had opinions the crowds had opinions and what do you say about Jesus? And so that was the gist of the message. And uh, anyway, I, I read this prayer for them before I had them join me in prayer. But the prayer is, Our Father in heaven, thank you for sending your Son to save all mankind. And I'm reading this pretty much how I read it in the home, because I don't want it to be fast. Jesus, I believe that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and I trust you alone for my salvation and my righteousness. Lord Jesus, I am not ashamed to publicly proclaim that you are my good shepherd and that I follow you always. Then I will look at the residents and I will say, is that a good prayer? Would you like to pray that with me? And a lot of heads are nodding, and then I will pray that with them. And this, brothers and sisters, is so important that we help them pray. If I were to say to you, uh, Jesus loves you and he wants to live in your heart, would you like that? And if you said yes, well, then let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, come and live in this person's heart. I don't know that that has the same impact that if you prayed and you invited Jesus into your heart. I understand there may be times when that's not possible because of health issues, but primarily speaking, generally speaking, you have to do it yourself. And I believe that if we can engage the residents in prayer like this, and then they get to take the paper home and they can pray it over and over again if they want. And each week they get a new prayer related to the message that we share. It's a powerful and joyful thing that while we are praying, I'm looking at that audience, at so many of the residents, most all of them, family members who are participating, even staff. And it's interesting about the staff. The staff, the first several Bible studies, they don't really sing. They don't really participate. But after a little while, I watch and they start joining in. It's like God is captivating their hearts as well. So I just wanted to share that part with you. Um, there are 
several ways, uh, as I said earlier, to serve the audience. It really depends on what the residents' capacity are. When when I'm in the assisted living, I will uh, have the resident take the wafer out of the bowl themselves and dip it in the cup and take it themselves. Now, even in an assisted living environment, there are some that cannot do it. So I will um, serve them. So it kind of depends on the, the group size, the capacity of the group, and uh, just the different logistical challenges you might run into. Now, uh, what I would like to say here at, at this point is more so toward the attitude of serving. It, it's so, so important that we, and I would say maybe above all, that we recognize that this is this is a sacred time and it's holy ground. And for those of us who are serving, I believe that the fear of God should have a place in us serving communion. I don't think it's a small thing in God's eyes. And so I really want to encourage that we are doing this in a spirit of reverence and awe. Jesus gave his life. He's the son of God and he gave his life and we're taking a moment to recognize that. What greater thing can we be talking about? What greater participation can we be expressing and recognizing and, and participating in? It's so amazing. You know, for me, I kind of, I, I look at baptism, I mean, uh, communion, sort of like baptism. In baptism, we we have an outward expression of a new heartfelt faith that, that we're expressing publicly to the world, to one another. We're proclaiming that um, the sacrificial death of Jesus and we're recognizing our need for his cleansing. And so we go into the water, we are baptized and it's a public thing. And it's important. It's so essential. Jesus commanded it. Well, I think that communion has traits like that. That communion is an outward expression of a continued faith in the life, the death, the resurrection, and the return of Jesus. And so, to me, at least the way I look at it, it has like the same value and the same holiness and sacredness and uh so i just wanted to encourage that so let's go back and look at what scripture says i i want to back up or just pause i guess from what we do and how we do everything and let's just look straight into the word of God at what scripture says. Uh, we're on page three now of your outline. And I, I, I wrote out on your paper uh, uh, the verse areas uh, where communion is shared. But I want to read out of Luke here. And then we're going to read also out of 1 Corinthians. It says in Luke 22, 14, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before you, I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood 
which is poured out for you. And I'm just I'm gonna stop there. So we have this example of how Jesus shared and he said, as we said earlier, to do this in remembrance of me. Now, I want to jump over to 1 Corinthians. And I'm going to, for just a moment, stop screen sharing. I'd like to see faces. That's all right. And uh, just want to read out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I'm going to start with verse 23. And this is Paul writing, and for what it's worth, and if it matters to anyone, I'm using the New International Version, the older, the older New International Version. <laughs> it says here, Paul writes, for I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. And again, I just want to recognize Paul wasn't at the table when Jesus served communion in the, in the Gospels. So somewhere along the way, this was so valuable to Jesus that he told Paul about it. And I think that it's so important for us to recognize that it wasn't something like a thing that he did and it was kind of cool. And no, this was like, I want you to do this. So again, for I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For, I, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So I want to talk to you about the purpose of communion. Because again, there's a lot of traditions and a lot of things that have been said that we have to do this and you have to be careful of this. And just based on what I see in scripture out of the gospels and out of first Corinthians here, the reason we receive this ordinance is, number one, is in remembrance of Jesus. Uh, I think all of us know that. But it's also, Paul wrote here in Corinthians, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So there's something valuable to Jesus for us to recognize and understand that he died for our sins. Now, for some of us, that's pretty elementary, and we like, oh, yeah, of course. But communion is an opportunity, especially in a senior care home, to bring our friends together and have them publicly recognize and even proclaim the Lord's death. And then third, I found it's to remember or anticipate and hope his coming, because it says here, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So there was this aspect of recognizing his second return. And I think that's really wonderful for us to be able to encourage our friends. This is what Jesus wants us to do. Now, the question might be, how often do we serve Holy Communion? For some of us, we think, oh, it has to be once a month, once a quarter, every week. I was in a church. We did it every Wednesday night and then once a month on Sunday. And so it kind of depends on what the tradition is. But as far as I can tell in Scripture, this is the directive, as often as you do it. So that was not like any time frame. Now, there is a verse in Corinthians that says, so then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, that would be also a potential consideration of when you would serve Holy Communion. Isn't it interesting? Jesus did not 
just go like we do and prepare a table with a chalice and a uh, bowl of wafers or even pita bread or whatever, or unleavened bread. It was right during a meal, right while they were eating the Passover meal. And it's, I think it's really valuable for us to realize that this was not like a separate thing to everything else that was going on. It's while they were eating, while they were at this meal. And I think that that is really valuable to take into consideration. Because I see in scripture, I see no other directives as to when we would actually serve communion. So then the question I want to address is when, I mean, who can receive Holy Communion? My answer, based on what I've found in Scripture, is all believers are directed to do this. All believers in Jesus, of course. And I think that we need to do our best to make provision so that any believer who wants to participate is able to. And so for that, we have to be creative. And for me, having been involved with nursing home outreach for almost 40 years now, I have had so many times where I had to pray and ask God, how am I going to do this or how am I going to do that? But that's why I love Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, where it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't try to figure it out yourself, in other words. But in all your ways, acknowledge him. So, Lord, I want to serve communion. I'm not really sure how I can do this under the conditions and situations that I, I'm involved or that are, are surrounding my situation. But what do you want me to do? And he'll direct your steps because he's good and he's faithful to his word. Amen. Amen. So what is the value of participating in communion well i believe that it's not magical and i believe that it doesn't well let me just say it's just not a magic wand but i do believe that it connects people with the essentials of our faith jesus came in the flesh that's so important. Even John recognizes that in 1 John, how valuable it is for people to be able to say that Jesus came in the flesh. But he came in the flesh. He lived for a while among us. He, he sacrificed his love to be the propitiation over our sin. And he rose from the dead after three days. These are the essentials. And another essential thing is he's coming back to get us take us to be with him. So it helps us, right? I know that probably everyone on this uh, Zoom meeting understands all this, and but it's something that we are helping our friends in the nursing homes recognize and participate in proclaiming this. You know, remember, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, and that's what we're helping them to do. I believe it really pleases the Lord. And I do want to say this, as I have been studying this whole sacrament out, all the way from Genesis, where it talks about Melchizedek and Abram meeting with him and serving bread and wine, all the way through Hebrews, uh, where it talks about that relationship and that connection. Exodus, there's, there's so many places where it speaks of things that are related to communion. And I think it's so much deeper than we realize. One of the things that I have confidence in is that over the years, I believe that we've been doing it well in the way that we've served the residents. But in, in the heart behind it and all that. But I do think that we're involved with something that's much deeper than we realize. So here's the big question. Who is qualified to serve communion? I find no specific directives of who is qualified. We don't have a lot of example in scripture. We know that Jesus did it, but we don't have an example of another person that I know of 
that was serving communion based on the directives that Jesus gave. So who's allowed to do it? Now, we have a book that we've published called Nursing Home Ministry, Where Hidden Treasures Are Found. And in that book, we give kind of a list of items under the topic of serving communion. We have a list of items that should be maybe taken into consideration. And I, I won't go through that list now, but those would be helpful if you're looking for some ideas and some directives. But here's the thing that I want to say. Some churches, of course, do not allow lay people to serve communion. And we know about that. Or maybe if you're a woman, you're not allowed because that's what they decided. Um, I, I, I want to be respectful to what the churches are. If you're a member of a church, you should do what the church tells you because you're a member of it. But if you're not uh, representing your church and you're in the home, you're representing your team before the Lord and you're under the, the authority of the home, particularly the activity director, and they're happy about you serving communion, I would just want to say that I have freedom to serve communion because there's nothing in scripture that says otherwise. But I would say this, that the reason some church groups do not allow non-ordained ministers to serve communion is that they want to assure that it's done in accordance with the beliefs of the church. So when a minister is ordained, he's taught all the different aspects of their denomination, how they, why they do this, what this is for, how it works. They're tested on it. They're, they're you know, it's like school and they have to go through all this and understand it. That way, when they go forth and they're representing that denomination, they're doing it all the same. And so a, a minister, church leadership does not want some lay person who has a different view on what communion is and what it's for representing the church and doing it different than what the church believes or um, wants them doing. So in all fairness, I think that we should be submissive and take it, take it into consideration why they do what they do. Why do they say it has to be this way or that way? And try your best to understand. But I would say this, that everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way, according to the Corinthians. That's the main thing. It needs to be fitting and orderly. So uh, I, I want to just share one more aspect before I opened up for some questions. But I have some cautions. When is it right, I guess, to not serve communion? Now, I'm not talking about receiving here. I'm talking about you and I as leaders serving Holy Communion. And if we are holding unforgiveness towards other brothers and sisters, other people, I think that that's a danger for us to be doing that. If you were hiding unrepented, continual sin from the Lord, now I, I think most of us know you can't hide anything from God, but sometimes we are just reluctant to repent of the thing that we have embraced. And I think that that's a dangerous place to be while you're recognizing the body and blood of Jesus. Um, just to do it, uh, you know, this is even who receives to do it, to go with the crowd. There's peer pressure or whatever. I would say uh, that's not a good plan because these things would be a contradiction to what we're acknowledging and proclaiming regarding Jesus. If I'm recognizing Jesus, if I'm representing him, then for me to be participating in something that's sacredly looking at who and what he is, his character, his directives, his commands, his, his life, his death, his resurrection, all that, for me to be receiving in a, in a way that is not representing him well, it would be a contradiction. And I think that he does not like that. I um, want to talk a little bit about serving 
those confined in their rooms. Now, I, I have not done a lot of this, but I would say that just from a logistical and practical perspective that we need to make sure, number one, is that it's just as special and sacred as it would be in a group. Uh, no, you're not going to set up a table with a cellist and a bowl in the room and all that, but there should be a time of scripture reading. If you're capable of singing, to maybe sing a hymn or two and to have a time of prayer. And if it's possible to engage that person in prayer as well. Um, there are, of course, some precautions you don't want to serve somebody who's laying down in bed they'd have to be sitting up things like that but there are it can be just as meaningful and that's probably a time where using the cup and the bread as individual elements is probably best because you can always help that person with um receiving it and i just kind of back up too in the and I, I know of people who serve communion and they use the cups and they use the wafers and they give them to them individually. Like that story I just read, it sounds like that's how he served it. Of course, that's just as well. It doesn't, there's no set way that it has to be done. The reason I do what I do is because we have the larger group and I just get afraid that it would take too long to really be able to serve 30 plus people. It's just a logistical thing. I don't think I'm violating scripture to do it that way. <laughs> so again, in the nursing home ministry where hidden treasures are found book, we have a, a number of items to that address this aspect of serving individuals. I wanna talk about navigating through different beliefs. When when there's, and it, I don't know if I've ever had it. It's like, I forget stuff. I don't hold on to struggles or whatever. I don't ever remember a resident calling me out regarding what communion was or was not in a, in a way that would be different than what I had shared. The fact that I'm saying, do this in remembrance of Jesus and remember that he loves you. He died on the cross for you, he rose from the dead. All those things that are tied in with that, I, it's pretty hard to argue that. And I have, I love it. I, I know that probably the most, I don't want to say opposing, but most contrasting faith group would be the Catholics. And in the mm -hmm. Northeast Ohio, where I serve, I would say 50% of the residents are Catholic. And I rarely, rarely have one of them say, I don't want to receive. Why? Because they see that what we're doing is uh, in keeping with scripture. And some of them know scripture. And I do sometimes, not always, sometimes I, when I present the elements, I say, you know, I can't change these into something different. You know, I won't really go heavy into that. I just say, you know, this is how Jesus did it. This is why he did it. And so let's follow him. And uh, I find that they have a lot of respect for the approach. Other considerations. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the one thing is how I do all things about prayer, about any message I'm giving. We need to keep the focus on Jesus and reading scripture to share what he said. And I, I spend very little time working on what others are doing wrong from my perspective or should have been doing this or that. I, I may once in a while mention it just in passing, but I don't try to nail any Christians to the wall. This is my perspective. If a person is a born-again believer, he or she is part of the bride of Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was engaged to now my wife, Kathy, back up the clock a few years, and you came to me and you started crabbing to me about my fiance, I don't know how well that would go for our relationship. 
And there's something about disharmony and disunity and, and causing disunity within the body that Jesus is extremely opposed to. And I would caution anyone to, you know, we can't hide our head in the sand. There is stuff that's going on that's not all right. But let's just be very mindful that we are lifting Jesus up more so than the wrong that we perceive others are doing. And so I think being a good listener, particularly in these one-to-one -one visits, being a good listener and a gracious friend is the very best foundation that we can have when we are talking to someone who has perhaps, one might say, opposing beliefs. Other considerations that I, I would just say is, I said earlier, I like to kneel as if possible in some way to be on eye level with the resident and try my best to make it so that they don't have to turn their head a whole lot. I want to be in direct focus of, of, of their vision so that it's comfortable for them. There's again, the picture that I had earlier. I, I think it's valuable if you know that you're going to serve communion next week or next time you're there to announce it to the group. And it gives them a chance to, to examine themselves, to prepare their hearts. You might be able to tell them a few things, you know, that, you know, we're going to have Holy Communion, which will be a time of recognizing Jesus. And I think it's a good idea that we examine our hearts before we do this and make sure there's no unforgiveness or no un unconfessed sins to to the Lord. So that's been helpful. And then finally, what I have in your outline is I have the primary scriptures related to communion listed out there on your outline. These are the more common ones. I, I do have John 6, 25 through 69, where Jesus minced no words in saying, I believe three times, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. It's interesting because he was not breaking bread and serving a cup when he said this. And so I look at that and I say, what are you talking about, Jesus? This is not the communion table. This is you're with your disciples they might not, have, I don't even think they were eating at the time, but he's telling them this. And I'm like, what in the world does this mean? And so I will just share with you in much prayer and thought, I, I kind of look at it like this. I think that eating the flesh of Jesus has a lot to do with and maybe primarily to do with Jesus is the bread that came down from heaven, which is what he was talking about at this time in John 6. And in every situation that I am in, in in life, I look to Jesus to learn from him, from his word, how to handle the situations, how to handle good, how to handle bad, how to handle challenges, everything. And I look to him and say, how do you want me to handle this? And then when he shows me in scripture how he wants me to be. Mostly it's a challenge to me. Mostly it's different than what I would have thought of. But when I say yes to him and I apply that to my life, I am eating the flesh of Jesus. That's how I see it. Now, to drink his blood, when I look back on my past, when I look at, I mean, even my past from, let's say this morning or yesterday or whatever, and I recognize that there is some behavior or attitude or whatever that is not in keeping with the character that Jesus wants me to have or the actions. And I look to him and I say, Lord, what I did in that situation was wrong. And I'm asking that you would forgive me and you would cleanse me with your blood. And I renounce that. I want to live like you. So cleanse me and purify me from this sin and unrighteousness. To me, that's drinking the blood of Jesus. Now, there's no physical stuff being taken in. But even in communion, as I said, I present it to the people. And 
I'm taking this wafer in, in this cup physically and it's it's not a piece of flesh it's not a, a portion of actual blood but in my heart and in my confession as i receive them i say lord jesus i receive your flesh because in the spirit that's what i'm doing in my heart of hearts i'm saying i receive your flesh and i eat it i receive your blood and i drink it I believe that Jesus is speaking of some very deep spiritual things, and that's just how I work through them. Maybe you would do that different, but I just wanted to say in case you're wondering, like, how, how do we do this? The last thing here is just additional scriptures for research. I've put those on your paper. And I want to encourage you as the handout I think we must be careful to not let our learning become complicated or convoluted in our preaching. A preacher or a teacher is going to learn three, four, five times more than the people they're teaching. And it's great to have that understanding and that knowledge because if a person asks a question, you have a pretty round perspective based on scripture and uh but we want to be careful to not overwhelm our audience they can only take in so much even in an assisted living or those who seem to be more cognizant for me i like to keep things really simple and just drop in one nugget of of depth and uh, for those who are hungry for the deeper things, I like to drop in a little nugget, but not really spend a lot of time on it. So I wrote on the paper, we do not explain the ingredients and the mixing and the baking and the decorating process when we serve a slice of cake. We just keep it simple and say, enjoy. So that's that's the outline. I would like Larry, would you lead us in a prayer for the Lord as we close? Yeah, I'd be honored to, Bill. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Father, we thank you, Lord, for these dear folks who have gathered this afternoon to hear how to uh, share communion with these residents. We thank you, Lord, that we can re share with them the remembrance of your death and resurrection. Father, we pray, Lord, you'll bless each one in their service as they serve you and as they go about their uh, many areas of service to the residents. Pray you'll bless and help and guide them. And we ask your blessings as we depart today. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you for your time. And I hope you have a great day. And give us stories about what happened. You know, I'd love to put some things in the newsletter about what God has done through your efforts to serve communion, how it was for the residents. All right. God bless you all.